Good afternoon, Mr. Secretary. Thank you for graciously agreeing to kick off this 73rd annual meeting of the Labor and Employment Relations Association. And congratulations on your new appointment and welcome to the nation's capital with all the rewards and trials that federal service brings. I am confident that you're going to make a huge difference in addressing the many challenges that working people are facing at this unique and uncertain moment in history. Thank you for your eagerness to serve at this moment. And I am delighted to have the privilege to have this conversation with you. So let's get started. Uh, why don't you start by talking about the journey that brought you to President Biden's cabinet and how have your experiences, both personal and professional, shaped the values and priorities that you bring to the Department of Labor? Well, thank you very much for having me today. And it's such an honor to be here. And, and thank you for um, this important conversation. Um, what shapes me? Um, my, my, par my parents uh, came to this country as immigrants from Ireland. Uh, my father came out in 1956. My mother came out in 1959. Um, they, they met here in Boston, um, quite honestly. Uh, and my father had an opportunity when he first came out here to join a union. He joined the labor's union. Uh, and, and, and my mother was uh, a homemaker, basically, at the time. She worked in different odds and ends jobs in Boston, taking care of, she was a nanny for a while. She was 17 when she came to America at first. Uh, and then she worked, you know, in, in different places. Uh, but, but the opportunity for a union when they met, when my parents met, allowed them the opportunity to save some money, buy a home, uh, help, you know, being part of that union, creating opportunities for other people to find jobs and getting, to getting jobs, uh, allowing opportunities to have health care and, and benefits. Uh, and, a digni and, a, and the pension for a dignified retirement. And that was kind of the family that I grew up in. And I followed my father into the building trades. And uh, prior to that, when I was at the age of seven years old, I, had, I was diagnosed with Burkitt's lymphoma. And the fact that in 1974, my father had health insurance, you know, I was able to get treatment at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in the Jimmy Fund, in the, in the Children's Hospital. Uh, as my father got older, when he retired, he was able to have uh, a pension. Uh, you know, enabled to, to, to be, to have some comfort in his life. Uh, when my, when my dad passed away, my mother um, was able to keep the pension going. So it really was, and is an opportunity into the middle class. Um, as you know, for the middle class life, obviously we need to make sure that we have investments uh, going into families. Uh, and, and, and those, that's what we want. That's what we want to do as elected official. Uh, I worked with, you know, unions and employers to create good jobs and pathways into those good jobs. Uh, as, as a mayor of the city of Boston, uh, our, our economy th thrived. Uh, and we also are pro worker. And I think there's real opportunities here to, I, I, don't, I don't agree with the, the business versus labor. I, I think that we need to be one unit moving forward for our economy. So we saw a lot of good things there. Yeah, thank you for that, for that observation. You also make a wonderful statement for why we need unions. Um, so, and I think you're probably unique among the secretaries of labor coming from being a mayor of a big city. So I wanna come back to that. But first let's talk about your policy priorities at the Department of Labor, particularly as we move into hopefully a post COVID world. Yeah. Uh, and in the wake of last year's many intersecting crises and what those crises exposed about pre-existing labor market imbalance, structural inequalities, and weaknesses in our workplace laws and social safety net. You know, there's no doubt that we need to build back better. Uh, and my priorities and our priorities that do well are central to achieving that vision. Um, as you mentioned, COVID exposed lots of inequities. Um, none of it was new. We knew about it. Uh, we learned that it's not only morally wrong, but also creates deep vulnerabilities in our economy. Uh, worker protections and worker welfare is a fundamental to the DOL mission. And, you know, I'm grateful um, to, to be head of an agency that has so many dedicated, committed career staff here that, that really work every single day in, in all these different areas. And, 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 you know, inequity in the labor market is a fundamental focus of mine. And, and when I started talking about the DOL, people were like, they, everyone agreed. Uh, you know, a lot of it's due to systemic racism, uh, gender inequality. Uh, it's the exploitation of immigrants. It's income inequality, um, you know, something that, that we have to continue to work on uh, at DOL. The workers with the lowest wages also tend to have the fewest benefits and protections. Uh, and that seems backwards. Um, the focus of the president's economic plan is, is a good jobs plan with pathways into the middle class and worker protection. 
uh, those are the priorities that, that I'm going to have at DOL. And, you know, and I know the president is laser focused on, on, on we will probably talk about it a little bit, but the American Jobs Plan, the American Family Plan. Uh, you know, we also, uh, in, in, in the administration, relaunched our apprentice advisory committee uh, to get voices from industry, from labor, and experts to, to help shape how we grow these programs. And we're also strengthening enforcement of worker protection uh, from workplace safety at OSHA, at OSHA to health care coverage and mental health parity at EPSA. I was on a Zoom earlier today uh, talking about mental health and substance use parity and, and making sure it's not just having health insurance, but making sure that people can afford the health insurance. Uh, it's pay equity at the Women's Bureau and anti-discrimination uh, efforts that we have in the department. So th there's lots of different policy areas that, that we cover here. And, and obviously, as you know, but, but now, those are some of the areas that we're really thinking about as, as we move forward here, at least in the, the first part of 2021. It, there are a lot of challenges and it's an ambitious and, and agenda, but uh, I have confidence. Um, Eve, so you've sort of touched on this. I, I looked it up. I think the Department of Labor enforces about 180 different federal laws and there are lots of different departments. Um, and uh, something that I know is of concern to people within the department itself, which is, how all the pieces tie together. Um, certainly the, the last year of COVID told us how important it was to integrate unemployment insurance and safety and health measures and wage and hour regulations um, for essential workers. But looking more generally, um, it, an, an a coordinated approach by the department seems essential, whether we're thinking about the gig economy, the fissured workplace, the impacts of technology or the changing expectations of workers. So have you thought at all about how all these pieces might tie together? Yeah, you know, collaboration is key. Uh, collaboration across agency lines, uh, breaking out of silos uh, is a priority of mine. And it's, it's even whatever I've done in government or anything I've worked on, uh, I'm a big person believer in collaboration and, and not having the silos, I think that's key. Uh, it's been something um, in Boston, our pandemic response took it to another level uh, and, and it kind of taught us uh, on, on how to move forward. We had a, something was called the crisis response forum. We had a daily call every day for seven days a week for months with leaders from every single agency within city government. And it, it literally changed city government, changed the way we deliver solutions and uh, deliver product, I guess, but changed how we fix solutions. Like we had 24 hours to come up with an answer. Um, this is an important step at DOL in responding to the president's exec executive order on racial equity and supporting marginalized communities. We have a working group of leaders across agencies uh, to look at everything that we do through the equity lens and develop a proposal. Uh, many times, uh, as you suggest, it's, it's a space between different services and the most vulnerable people that fall through the cracks and we have to continue to make sure that doesn't happen. We have an opportunity to, to strengthen our coordination uh, that's that's key and stronger consistency uh, like for example stronger consistency in the state unemployment system is another big part of that so it, it really is about collaboration and working collectively together I think you've seen it you've seen it in your time as well uh, when, when an organization isn't working collectively together um, inevitably there's going to be problems and I think at the Department of Labor by having trying to set that tone at the top is really important and it seems to me that your experience in Boston over the last year will be invaluable going forward. Yeah. Um, so let's move on to the task force. So the Biden-Harris administration has established a cabinet level task force on unions and worker empowerment. Uh, the vice president chairs it, you vice chair it. Can you talk a little bit about that and what you hope to accomplish? Yeah, um, you know, as, as you know, a lot of people know union density uh, has been declining in the United States for decades roughly from 30% in the 50s to about 10% today. Uh, some of that decline is due to the change in the nature of work and the industry, different industries that we have. But the truth is the system has been tilted against workers and, and their efforts to, to organize. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a, an economic and social problem. Uh, it, it's, it also, is, in my opinion, is worse than the economic uh, inequality that we see in the, in the state, in this country. Uh, real wages have stagnated, um, even as workers uh, productivity has, has increased and soared. Good health insurance and retirement plans are harder to find. Um, you know, once thriving communities have, we've seen them struggle now and, and black and brown workers have found it even harder bef than before to enter the middle class and stay there. I mean, we can just look back on the numbers. Um, it's weakening our democracy. Uh, when workers 
come together in unions, we can stand up and in corporate abuse and, and fight the corporate abuse and, and count on Wall Street's power and the political system uh, without unions too often they're on their own. And it's just, it doesn't have to be even unionized workers, just creating a strong middle class is key. I mean, that's something that we need to do. So um, what the president is asking, um, asking every cabinet and federal agency to look at what they can do to empower workers, enable, enable people right to organize if they choose to do that. Uh, is also He's also, and I am as well, a strong supporter of the PRO Act. Uh, that would go a long way towards restoring workers' rights. And when you think of, when I think about organized labor and, and I do a little bit of history looking at it, you know, you look at the strength of the middle class back in, in the in the 50s and 60s. And, and as you saw the decline in the middle class as we came to this kind of space where it's the people reference the top one or 2% of the country and everyone else, you've also seen the decline in the labor, labor, labor unions. And, and so we need to get back to building a middle class that works for everybody, I think, in a lot of ways. And that's you know, that's what the president's focus has been and, and from when he sat as a candidate. Um, that's really what we should be focused on in our country. We shouldn't be, you know, trying to make somebody's life a little better. We really have to do better than that. And and what's the timetable if there is one for the- 180 days. 180, 180 days, yeah. We're gonna, we have to have a report back to the president. Um, the task force, the chair of it is the vice president, uh, Vice President Harris, and, and I'm the co-chair. So uh, as a matter of fact, um, there's a meeting right now as we as we speak. Uh, on, on the task force uh, with some of the staff and the team to think about how we're going to move forward. Well, good. Con good luck with it. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, so you sort of alluded to this already. We both know all too well that, although I think you tried to duck this uh, at the beginning, that uh, views on labor issues are deeply held and usually divided. Um, this is an oversimplification, but labor on one side and the other. So what are your views about why this is? And do you have thoughts about how we might find more consensus on key issues? And critical here, I wonder whether your experience in the building trades, and I spent a little time with the bricklayers, so I know the uniqueness of the building trades. Do you think your building trades background and your experience as, as mayor of Boston uh, gives you a per particular perspective on how to bridge these divides? I actually believe it does. Um... You know, I, I, I have always been somebody who believes in common ground exists wherever you can find it. Uh, whether it was a member of the legislature in Massachusetts, we predominantly Democratic legislature, but some of my closest friends are Republicans and we didn't agree on all the issues, but we were able to have differences and, and not make it personal. Uh, my time in the building trades, uh, when I took over, when I was asked to, when I took over the building trades, um, I didn't have to meet with union, union contractors and necessarily, and I didn't have to meet with developers that built union. What I did was I focused on meeting developers and contractors that were non-union to create a dialogue and an opportunity to, to build relations with them. Uh, my time as mayor, when I ran for mayor, all the papers said that I would not be a good mayor, I'd be bad for business and I'd ruin the city and all this other stuff. And, and quite honestly, the opposite happened. Uh, we we're able to create 86 million, uh, 86 million uh, square feet of new development in the city worth $48 billion, is able to have a AAA bond rating, say, seven consecutive years, is able to, to, to build a relationship with the business community and labor where we're able to collaborate together. And, and I, I do believe in collaboration. I know it can happen. There's no question that it can happen. We can find common ground. Um, we need to, we also need to level the playing field for workers. Uh, it's, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it's been tilted against them for, for, for quite some time, but it's important to, to make sure that, that we continue to move forward. So, you know, when, when I think of when I think of Washington or I think of Capitol Hill or I think of Beacon Hill, the strategies that we're looking at here will have the support of businesses. It's bipartisan support. It's infrastructure investments. It's education. It's job training. It's access to child care and family care. If you're a business um, run by anybody, a Republican or a Democrat, conservative or, or independent, or liberal, whatever it is, you know, you need those infrastructure investments to grow your business. You need education for your employees. You need to make sure you have good job training and you need to make sure that, that the people in your company have access to family care and child care. Th those are all, those aren't Democrat or Republican priorities. Uh, all quite honestly, labor or management priorities. They're, they're American people priorities. So I do feel that we can, you know, we have the opportunity to do that, you know, and, and I feel like, you know, and I think that President Biden, if you, if you, if you listen to his words and, and hear what he said, even in his time as United States Senator, like he doesn't, he doesn't draw lines. Uh, when he's talking, he's talking about how do we move our country forward for the American person. That's really what we need in this country. We, we need more talk of that. I think the divisiveness in this country has not helped us. And, 
And, and these plans that are being put forward, uh, as, as I just said, they're not Republican plans, they're not Democratic plans. They're for the American person, the worker, the person who lives in this country, it's for America. So um, I definitely think we can find common ground. And I know we've had a couple of decades here of, of picking sides and staying in our corner, but I think it's time that we break down those silos and start working together on, on, on issues that of common interest for the American people. Well, I wish you well with that. I, I, you know, I think you're well poised to do it. The divides are corrosive. Do you have any specific thoughts about reaching out to the business community in the coming months? Well, I have. I mean, I've reached out um, to the, some. I've already talked to some of the business folks uh, in, in the country. Uh, obviously, I have a great relationship with the business folks in the city of Boston as being the mayor for seven years. Uh, but I've already begun those reach outs, and I've asked some of my 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 uh, my, my my acquaintances here in the city to to let business leaders know who I am, what I'm all about, because I think people will label you as, oh, you're a union guy, you must be bad for business and might not, must not want it. So we've done some of that. And also uh, uh, Secretary Gina Raimondo, Secretary of Commerce, uh, we've, we've spoken a lot about, you know, taking, you know, kind of on the, sh on the road, our show on the road, commerce and labor, uh, because we, without commerce, you don't have labor, without labor, you don't have commerce. And, and, and how do we work collectively together and, and you know, we both, we've appeared at a couple of different events already, Gene and myself, and we're talking about supporting, because I, I mean, I'm a business, I support business. I mean, I support business, like I, in the city, you know, I have a good story to tell. And and, and I think that that's a good thing. And, and Gina supports labor. Uh, and, and, you know, we're going to work together on this. And I think as we get further down the road here, as people get more familiar with us and, and what we're doing, I think, I think people will start to see, oh, these, they're right, they're right. This is a good thing. Well, that's great. And I assume you know each other from New England. Yes, the, the, the governor and the mayor. Yeah, that's right. So uh, we don't have a whole lot of time left, but let me just ask you this. There have been a lot of debates about the future of work and especially robotics and AI and technology. Um, how are you thinking about uh, this changing technologies and, and how do we ensure that workers will have some voice in shaping the future of work? Yeah, you know, the narrative has been that workers lose their jobs to technology. Uh, and that's really only a small part of the story. We can create many more good jobs that we've, than we've lost with the right policies and investments. Uh, and I think that that takes me to the American Jobs Plan. Uh, investments in research, innovation, infrastructure, manufacturing, green, green energy. And I think that, you know, when, when the president launched this plan, we talked about an infrastructure plan. And everyone got so tied up on infrastructures, roads and bridges. And infrastructure is so much more than that. It's, it's research, it's innovation, um, it's infrastructure, it's manufacturing. When you think about manufacturing, we think about an assembly line. Manufacturing today can be different. It's green energy. They, they can replace some of the jobs of, 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 the, of the, you know, the, 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 the coal mines and places like that. So we can really do a lot of good things. Uh, these technologies are going to be the tools that, that in the hands of our workforce moving forward. So a big part of the focus here at the Department of Labor is expanding um, in-demand job training programs, prepare workers for the jobs of the future. Uh, and, and I think that, you know, we, we can do it. And I think that that's something that I think we have to be real intentional. And then we have to also look through the, the lens of equity to make sure that these jobs are are being given to people of color and women. I mean, we have to make sure that everyone benefits from the workforce. So um, I don't wanna I don't want to label this, we have an industrial revolution on our way, but there's an opportunity here really to the president, when he, when he launched these two jobs plan, the America Jobs Plan, the America Families Plan, it wasn't in response to the pandemic, it was about how do we remain competitive and continue to lead the word, world in these different areas of research, innovation, infrastructure, manufacturing, green energy and other jobs. That's that's what President Biden wants to see, and that's quite honestly what I want to see. And the Department of Labor is going to have a big role in this in this area as well, particularly around the, the job training and the apprentice programs, but some of the other stuff as well. Well, good. Again, these are very ambitious plans, but so very necessary. Um, so um, this organization is uh, unique in, in bringing together labor and business and academics and practitioners and neutrals and advocates. Uh, and so I know the audience is going to be really very interested in, in everything you've had to say. Um, and I'd like to sit here and give you an invitation for next year's meeting, hopefully in person in Detroit. Um, but at that time, what would you hope to report to us about your accomplishments of the first year? Thank you. Uh, first of all, good luck in the conference. And I hope, um, I know it's been a difficult year for everybody. So thank you for, for continuing the important conversations you're having. 
Um, you know, I hope I, I'm able to stand uh, at a podium somewhere next year and talk about implementing the major pieces of the American Jobs Plan, the American Family Plan that has been passed by Congress and signed by the president into law. Um, it, this will be transformative uh, in terms of security of working people and in, uh, in substantially in our economy, and which I think is gonna be really important. Uh, but in either way, what we'll, we will have done it, in OSHA, in, in the Department of Labor has hired hundreds of new OSHA inspectors uh, and they'll be out in the field. Uh, we will have funded more registered apprenticeship programs along with new pre-apprentice programs with supports to help marginalized workers in the pathway. Uh, and this is all going on now and I'll be able to talk about it more. We'll be able to make progress helping states modernize the unemployment systems that significantly significant focus on our budget request that we've asked through the American Rescue Plan, $2 billion. So we're we'll gonna be working Across the board, I hope American workers will feel a lot more support, more partnership, more optimism about the future than they have had in a long time. I think that that's gonna be key. And I think that we need to do this together. Um, business, labor, community, all of us working collectively together uh, to move our country forward. This has been uh, a very challenging year and a half for a lot of people. Um, for those folks that are watching, anyone who lost loved ones, I want you to know, they're gonna be you and you're in my thoughts and prayers. Um, this has been a tough year for a lot of people. And um, as President Biden says, we need to build back better. Uh, and we have an opportunity to build back better. By, by next June, uh, I'm hoping that we're standing, I'm sitting on a stage somewhere and we're, we're talking about uh, how, how, how much advancement we've done in a very short period of time. So I want to thank you for the opportunity to, to talk to you today. Um, hopefully it's been insightful and great to me. I appreciate it. And thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for your for your insights, and we, we wish you all the very best going forward with a, a difficult time. But as I said at the beginning, I am fully confident that you're going to make a big difference. So thank you again. Appreciate it.